my opinion, it uh, the nest big thing in CSS, an introduction to native class nested. Um, but did you did you see what I did there with the the title, the nest big thing? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you. But tell you what, we're gonna we're gonna try something else here. There we go. Let's start off first. First talk of the night. Let's do some jokes. CSS jokes. Why do programmers prefer dark mode? Why? Okay, thank you. Because light attracts bugs. Okay, okay. Let's do another one. Why was the CSS class always tired? Because it was constantly being selected. Okay, now that, that could have gone like one or two ways, I feel like it could have killed, or maybe it didn't. Um, chat GPT generated these, right? So I'm off the hook, it's fine. Um, but let's talk about nesting in CSS. Uh, class nesting is a way to streamline your CSS code to improve the readability and reduce the risk of naming conflicts by creating a structure that mirrors the HTML structure of your web page or your application. Now, what do I mean by the HTML structure? Um, I mean, just like we have, here's an example you can see on the screen. Just as we have a top level div with a class of foo, we also have a child element with a class of bar. You can also say that this element is kind of nested inside of the top level, the foo element, right? We're used to this. This is kind of what we do right now. If we were to style this, one way that we could do it is to create a selector to target foo. We can make our styles. We could also say we want to select an element with the class of bar but only those that are inside of an element with a class of food. This should be pretty normal, right? This is what we do right now. Um, but quick uh, show of hands, who's used like a preprocessor? SAS, less. okay, awesome. So you probably know about class nesting, right? That's awesome. We use it all the time. But the cool thing is that native support for class nesting is coming to CSS. It's been a longstanding feature from developers and it's finally arrived, kind of because it's not widely available yet on all major browsers. I think a few support it, but just letting you know, it's coming. We're gonna be able to play with it a little bit today. And hopefully when you get home, you can Google it and check it out yourself. So here, what does it look like? What are we gonna be able to do with native class nesting? This should look very familiar to those who use SAS or something like that, like a preprocessor where we create a selector for foo and then nested directly inside is our selector for bar okay that should already be really cool i'm really excited about it but that's native you don't have to use any other preprocessor and transpile at build time but there's an alternative syntax that we could use that you should be made aware of and that is using the ampersand here and then using our selector the ampersand denotes where the parent class should be placed and we'll talk about this in a minute but there's some things you need to be made aware of that you know this ampersand is going to come in handy and that's actually what we're gonna look at now. This is something to look out for, is that when we talk about nesting in native CSS, our selector must start with a symbol, okay? So here's an example where we have foo and we have a selector for a button inside of foo. At the top there, that's actually invalid. Uh, I don't think you'll get an error screaming at you, but it won't be applied the way you want it to. Uh, so that's something to know. Easy fix though, we can just use the ampersand here in our selector, and this would be valid CSS nesting, and it'll continue working as you will, as you want it to. So what are some of the pros and the cons of nesting CSS classes? Some of these are probably apparent, especially for those who use SAS, uh, but we don't have to repeat the same selector multiple times in a style sheet. Um, I'll admit, I tend to go for something like SAS whenever I'm using like a code pen, just because I love nesting that much. It's really helpful. It's also more efficient. It can help you write less code and reduce the risk of redundancy. Uh, so that way you don't have to apply styles throughout the style sheet and you can do it all in one single selector. Uh, this is a big one for me is nested media queries. So typically I think we can all agree we see media queries kind of shoved down to the bottom of our style sheet. There's other ways to do it, right? But sometimes it's hard to maintain that context and you have to go down to the uh, to the bottom of the file, look at those media queries to see your responsive styles. 
now we can actually maintain that context and keep our media queries inside of our Nessus selector, which is awesome. Uh, there are some cons. Number one, you can have like a bloated style sheet. Now this kind of seems like um, a counterpoint to being more efficient and not having to write as many uh, uh, selectors, but you can actually go a little bit too much into Nessus and you can go overboard. Uh, and so the CSS team definitely has some recommendations as far as how many levels deep you should go. And you can look at that on your own, uh, but more will probably be um, surfacing as people get their hands on uh, version one of CSS nesting. But that's kind of the point, right? We wanna be able to play with it. We wanna be able to give some feedback, send it to the team so they can refine it for version two and ultimately uh, mass adoption across browsers. Okay, here's where it could kind of get scary. We'll see. We're gonna go ahead and give it a try, a live demo. Okay, cool. Still showing? Yeah, awesome. Okay, so here's a code pen that I have with uh, the good old boy over here in kind of a Polaroid. And what I have is some default HTML, nothing special. And I have some vanilla CSS on the bottom, okay? What we're gonna try and do is refactor this CSS to use nesting. It's pretty easy, but it's good experience. So let's take a look. Uh, at the top, I have a few variables defined. I'm setting a background color. And then let's look at what we have right now. We have the container selector. It's doing its own thing. That's great. But then here, we also have another selector where we're targeting the H1. Now notice we are duplicating the container class here in this selector. So in our minds, we should be like, okay, there's an opportunity to refactor. Nesting would be great here. Let's keep scrolling. We have a Polaroid class, which is great. That's awesome. And then we have some Polaroid content image uh, selectors here. We're even selecting an image inside of this class. Okay, so let's put a pin in that too. We'll come back to it. And then at the bottom, we also have a selector where we're selecting any element with the class of caption that is inside of the Polaroid element. And so we can start to refactor this now that we have a bird's eye view of what's happening. So I'm gonna try and do this with one hand. Let's see how it goes. Um, first things first is let's style the H1 here. So if I go ahead and comment this out, we should see our H1 return back to its default color for the text. And let's go ahead and nest this inside of the container selector. So we could do this, right? We can say color, White. Now, do you think that this is going to work? It's not going to work. Why is it not going to work? It doesn't have a symbol, right? That's awesome. So we're targeting the native semantic HTML element, but we have to start with an ampersand here or another selector. We could use any kind of selector that would work for this scenario. But if we use the ampersand, you can see our H1 is now white, which is awesome. Okay, let's skip over the Polaroid uh, selector for now. We'll come back to it. And let's move on to the content image. So here we are duplicating the selector again to target the image itself inside of this parent container. So that way we can use things like object fit. To go ahead and refactor this, let's go ahead and use the ampersand, we'll say image. I think I added a period there. We'll grab all this, we'll paste it. We'll comment that out and everything should look the same, right? Now, we could go ahead and also do this. We can do that as well, because that's a simple, right? Cool. All right, moving on. Finally, we have the caption selector inside of the Polaroid element. So I'm gonna copy this and we'll go back up because we do have that top level Polaroid selector right here. And inside of here, I'll just say caption. I'll paste in the CSS and you can see it pop back into place. Now, I've tried to make this example where we can see different use cases here where we're selecting and combining selectors with semantic HTML elements. And also here at the end, we actually just used uh, a class, right? We don't have to add the ampersand here. We could if we want to. Uh, I tend to just because I like to stay consistent and it helps uh, you know, make sure I don't have any bugs if we're targeting those HTML elements where maybe we don't have a symbol to start out with. But there we go. So everything's working now. Now, one of the cool things here, and we know that it's working, the preview's working, but we have another paragraph tag here with a class of caption. 
it is outside. I know it's kind of hard to see. It's outside of our Polaroid div, right? So it's the same kind of element. It's outside of Polaroid, yet it's not the one that's uh, being targeted here. So really cool and very simple to do, right? So I just wanted to show a quick example of how we could refactor stuff. I hope you start to use this too. Give it a shot. Code pen is really easy to get up and going with it uh, and give it a shot. So wrapping up, I know we are coming up on time. CSS class nesting enables the continuation of selectors and the grouping of related styles within them. But it's important to note that while CSS classes um, are useful in nesting them, it's not yet fully supported across major browsers. Again, I think there's only one or two, but make sure you go to caniuse.com or .org, I think, and make sure that it's available in your browser. But this is only version one, right? So it's not ready for mass adoption. We're wanting version two to come soon. And they might even add some more syntactic sugar, which makes this even easier and maybe more you know, closer to SAS or something like that. Uh, I do have some resources for you. So you can feel free to go ahead and scan this QR code if you want these slides. Uh, which also have links to some informative articles that I think would be beneficial if you're interested in learning more, including from the Chrome team uh, and even uh, a few others right there. So there we go. The next big thing in CSS. Thanks so much for listening. If you have questions, feel free to hit me up uh, after all the talks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Braden. I'm super excited for this next speaker. It is their first talk, so that means be extra cruel and harsh. Uh, Edwin is a fantastic member of the community. He was super excited to be a part of this. I'm super excited to have him here. So without further ado, Edwin Jordan. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you, All right, good. Screen share. Screen share. You should oh. have a bunch of screen share now. Uh, yeah. So you can choose which thing you want to screen share. OK, if it's just like one monitor, then. Yeah. Um, oh, entire screen? OK, got it. OK, here we go. OK, we're good. Uh, OK. So now go back to your slides and let's see. Do you see a screen? Perfect. OK, perfect. All right. Uh, wait, how do I? Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, testing. All right. Hi. Uh, my name is Edwin. Um, I didn't prepare enough of a bio um, compared to Braden because I was told like I had like a limited time span for this. Um, but basically, um, I'm a front end developer from CodeStream Studios. It's a company that's uh, devoted to providing like education and coding basics to uh, students from like grade school levels and uh, beyond. So uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about a technology called the View Transition API. And this is a technology that I think many of you have already been exposed to, even if you don't notice or like are, are familiar with this exact term. And you are exposed to this technology every time you open up your mobile device, right? Uh, whether it's you're on your home screen and you're readjusting elements um, to like organize them on your home screen, or if you're on like a popular app like Spotify or TikTok and you click on an element and it transitions into the next page. So I'm just gonna show you some like example GIFs here to uh, demonstrate what I'm talking about here. So as you can see um, here, like for the second image, uh, this is these are two separate pages, but the image of this cat, right? It starts off on page one and then it transitions into the second one, right? It enlarges. And basically, like this feature is very like crucial towards like captivating the user's focus because while you're using a touch navigation, this combines very well with the view transition because the element you're working with always stays in focus of you as the user, right? And in addition to that, um, like a key point that I'm going to be touching on. Uh, 
afterwards is this also works very well uh, in tandem with data fetching from like APIs. If you want certain information uh, to be presented like more like smoothly and more efficiently. And other than that, it just looks really nice. And sorry, I'm like a little distracted by the, the theme here. So um, because like uh, mobile apps are like just becoming really revolutionary in, in how like you're navigating through different pages uh, through like these view transitions, it almost seems as if um, like modern day desktop and laptop apps are just kind of falling a step behind because a lot of them don't carry this kind of feature. When you're browsing through like Wikipedia, for instance, um, you know, when you click a hyperlink, it doesn't like smooth, like flow smoothly into the next page. It's just a blank, uh, page transition. And when you compare that with the mobile app, it just doesn't seem as engaging, right? So uh, the next point I want to cover here real quick is, uh, are page transitions possible in desktops? Absolutely. But uh, right now, it's kind of a pain to pull it off because uh, of issues like state transitioning, uh, particularly in uh, technologies such as React. Um, however, with the View Transitions API, uh, you're, allow, you're, you're able to circumvent these issues and implement this kind of technology uh, on a more widespread and easier level, right? And so uh, let me just show you some examples here of uh, like basic view transitions. And th these first two are not going to be like groundbreaking, but it's just to show you the principles, right? So this very first one, uh, just please watch what happens. So like I'm going to click this uh, hyperlink. And that's just a crossfade, right? It's not super impressive. But if you understand what's actually happening here, then it starts to open up like a larger realm of possibilities. So what's actually happening here is that th these pages are not waiting for the previous one to finish their animation before uh, the, si the, the second one plays the animation. So let me show you a different one, which is like slowed down to kind of illustrate that point further. So I'm going to navigate to page two. So you can see residue from the first page is still visible even after you've navigated to the next page, right? So in traditional like page fades that we see on a lot of like older websites, the first page always has to wait to complete its animation before the next page is triggered, right? So that kind of limits your options in terms of like, you know, like transitioning elements from page to page. Now, um, Another quick example here is uh, like um, if you're familiar with the Star Wars uh, fade in, right, that they do in a lot of the movies. Uh, this is a little dark, so you might have to um, focus in a little. This is slower. So here we go. I click this image, right? And here we go. It slowly fades um, into the second page. You're already on the second page, but residue from the first page is still visible, right? So um, going forward here, uh, sorry, let me just go back. Okay, and another uh, example here, just want to uh, keep streaming along here. This is um, by Jake Archibald, whose article uh, I based my research on, right? So this is like one of the key examples that really inspired me to uh, incorporate this technology into my own project. So I'm going to click one of these video screens, right, and watch what happens. See, this image enlarges, and that element never, like, you never lose focus of that image, that element, right? So um, just like a mobile device, right, the, uh, the focus retention is sustained, and you never lose, like, it never gets disconnected. And then if I click another video here, right, on the side, and then I go back, notice how it navigates back to the second video and not the first. It's almost like it's, it's very, like, uh, it can notice which route or which directory uh, you're currently on. Uh, so that's like a very intelligent uh, navigation system we got going here. All right, so um, going back to the slides here, um, just to kind of give you like a, a visual cap of like how I would illustrate it personally, this is an example of how I would illustrate like standard page navigation. When you go to Wikipedia, uh, you're looking up elephants, right? And then you click the image of the elephant, uh, the screen flashes, and then you're on the image of the elephant. And you might have to jolt your eyes to a different direction because the image, like uh, the size changed or the position changed on the second page. However, with page transitions, this is kind of uh, something that happens. Uh, the image trails along and it leaves like a path of residue so that you can follow where it's going in the second page, right? So um, what I wanna showcase next is uh, for my personal project that I've been working on, uh, apologies in advance for those of you that have already seen this because you've already been exposed this a hundred times. Um, currently I'm working on like a Pokemon de uh, card deck building app. Right, uh, just to kind of reconnect with like nostalgia and people who are also familiar with the franchise. And one of the issues that I was having here is 
Oh, are you serious? Okay. <laughs> the, the, this site is blocked because I don't know, it's like some sort of security issue. Uh, guess what, fight? Yeah, I, I got the guess thing. I, it's okay, I, I can just skip this, but it's not a huge issue. But um, just to like give you a cap of what I was gonna show, um, actually maybe I can do it here. Okay, uh, is this? Okay, this one is still failing. Okay, whatever. Um, basically in my app, um, I'm relying heavily on modals to display information. But the problem with modals is that, you know, you have like a lot of z-index hogging so that a lot of elements that are outside cannot be accessed until you close out of that modal. So I thought, okay, um, how can I overcome this issue? And when I started researching view transitions, that's when the solution came into play. So I'm gonna show you like a, a demo that I ripped from my homepage. Um, right. And so basically what I want to do is when I click one of these images, I want it to uh, like to take myself to a screen that presents more image about like this particular card set. Um, and normally I had it, uh, done by using modals. However, uh, with view transition, I want you to, uh, take notice of three things here before I click on one of these. Okay. The first is the nav bar. Uh, the second is the nav bar image. And the third is the image about to, I'm about to click, which is this base set one here. So uh, here we go. You see, it was a little slow, but you see how the elements faded into the second page. And this is not the same page we were on. This is not um, like a single page application, because if I show you the messy code here, these are all separate HTML pages, right? So if I go back uh, and then I navigate back, the image resettles back into its origin position. Um, and the way that this is happening is um, with the view transitions, what it's doing is taking a snapshot of this element that I designated it to. And then on the second page, I designate the same tag in CSS with this mass, like uh, this hero image. So I'm just gonna show you here real quick. Um, this for the tag, you wanna use uh, like this property called view transition name. And this is how essentially you're gonna set up siblings uh, for any images that you want to transition while you're switching pages. So for instance, um, this image and this image both have the same uh, view transition name tag, right? Which is called um, the banner image, right? So that's how it tells this, uh, the code. Like um, when, you, when you navigate back, then you're gonna transition back into that same image. Now, another thing here, um, which you may have noticed in the HTTP3 image uh, example that I showed previously, if I go to another image, right, and then I select a different card pack, for instance, you would think that if I navigate back, then it would, it would just navigate to the first image that I had initially been to. However, it, it recognizes the URL of the image that I'm navigating to and from. And that's because with the view transition, what I can do is um, set up these kind of like navigation interception functions that say, hey, uh, which route are you like aiming to go to? And which element on that page has that particular route? And then you can set those uh, with a certain, like certain properties in the CSS with these view transition names so that the system always recognizes which image and elements it can transition back into right so it's just a very uh fancy feature that i've just been loving uh to ex like uh, that i've loved experimenting with so far um okay so then going back to the slides here um some drawbacks unfortunately with this technology are that it's only compatible at this moment with google chrome 111 plus and microsoft bing so um similar to what like how Braden was showcasing like if you go to can i use then it'll just kind of showcase like you know all of these uh, technologies or browser environments that view transition is capable of running in. um and so like as you can see like many of them are not compatible but they are currently working on rolling out more compatibility with these browser environments um, however, this drawback isn't, you know, like a game changer because um, what you can do is actually integrate like fail safe functions within your code, uh, such as like progressive enhancement that says, okay, if your browser environment uh, is capable of running the view time, sorry, the view transition API, then go ahead and run it as normal. But if it cannot, if the browser does not support it, then just transition the page normally, right? And so uh, with that being said, the drawbacks are not as severe um, and like, you know, code breaking as like, you know, some other features that, you know, might have that kind of instability. And so um, 
moving on to the next topic here is with React integration, which I personally attempted, it was a bit difficult for me because I didn't have like a lot of experience with flush sync uh, or React routers. Um, it's definitely possible, but you just need to use either like flush sync to force like synchronous uh, changes in your state, or you can utilize React router. Uh, but it's just like either or you don't have to use both of them um, and then afterwards like the view transition API will be perfectly compatible with your app. And so um, that being said, and just kind of wrapping up, the reason I'm just so excited about this technology is because, um, you know, it's like allowing a desktop environment to captivate the same level of focus that a mobile app would bring you, right? Uh, apps such as TikTok, like, you know, you got like some negative side effects when you're looking at like teenagers nowadays where they're just glued to the screen because like the, the user uh, interface and just the ease of transition is so addicting. It's so easy to use. And I'm not saying that, you know, our desktop app should have that level of engagement, but if you could just take a fraction of that and bring it to the desktop experience, I think you could do like a world of wonders with this. And uh, for like any of you that are like CSS experts and you can just um, incorporate like animations in conjunction with this technology, that that's, I think that's just like some groundbreaking, um, like boundaries that you know we need to that we're going to be able to cross so um on a final note uh, just the works that i cited for this are jake archibald's uh breakdown of the view transitions he has both an article and a video that go into like a lot more detail and then also malcolm key's guide to like incorporating this technology in react um which is very essential for like i guess like if you're using it to um like build single page applications with this technology and so, yeah, that is pretty much all for that I have for today. So thank you very much. Appreciate the time. All right, perfect. Uh, number one, great talk for your first talk. Yeah, thank you. Kill the man. All right. You really did. Thrill. First talk. I think we're going. No, he says he's flush like flush sink, but don't worry about it. Look, really love to talk. Uh, without further ado, Sarah Shook, our next speaker. Can't wait. Go, Sarah. Now you can take. You can oh. mute this. I need to share my screen, huh? On Zoom. Gosh. Where is he? All right. Am I good now? I don't even know. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, am I supposed to use the microphone? <laughs> Okay. All right. So my name is Sarah and I also did not do a presentation because I was too busy or an introduction because I was too busy um, working on the pixel perfect animations um, that still aren't perfect, but um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I love CSS. It's a, a bit like art, you know, and then um, as in a professional environment, you don't really get to have a lot of fun with things like animations and transitions. Everything's just like, oh, slide over a little bit and it's good. Um, but I enjoy having a lot of fun with CSS and finding some fun things to do with it in my free time. So hopefully I uh, can share some things that you don't know yet. So before I get started, um, how many of you guys have worked with fast and like work with it regularly? Okay, how about on CSS? How many of you guys like to work with a lot of animations? Okay, well, hopefully <laughs> I will uh, maybe make you like them more at some point. So without further ado,
Let's get sassy. Repeat the animation. <laughs> all right. So um, before I guess I get so well, first of all, we said we didn't know not a lot have people have really worked with a lot of animation. So I wanted to first touch on what tran transform and uh, transition. Um, because when I first started getting into CSS and animations, I got those confused so many times and I still find myself confusing them if I'm going too fast. So um, let me find my pizza slice. Got it? Yep. All right. Um, give me a second. All right. All right, so with the in, with this intro, you can see that it slides in. Um, but that's because it has an animation that has transition. So what I want to show you is when if I have I have a media a nested media query in here, like Braden mentioned, and I have a margin right of forty VW um, if it's a bigger screen. So as you can see, if on smaller screens, it just kind of jumps over. There's no smoothness, it just jumps. So the transition, I like to think of like transform, the element itself, the pizza slice, if you're like into English, it's like the, the noun, it's the object of like our, our sentence, right? Transform and the animation are like the verbs. You're telling what that, um, what that element is going to do. But then you have transition, which is like the adverb. It describes how you're going to make that transformation happen. So you can transition different properties for the sake of this uh, anime or for this presentation, I'm just doing all. But now that we have the transition here, if we go in and out, now it's gonna be nice and smooth, right? Um, so now it doesn't jump around because we have that transition property. Uh, in addition, there's lots of other different things that you can do as far as transform is concerned. You can do translate, which is what we're doing here. We're translating it on the X axis. Um, and then you can translate it on the Y, but you can also do things like you can scale it. And let me see if I have a scale real quick. Yes. So. All right, and then we'll just do infinite for this. But there's all sorts of things that you can do based on transforms themselves. You can transform um, with our animation. We can set it to be infinite, or if we only want it to happen once, we just put it at forwards. And that means that it's going to take the last step of our animation keyframe, and it's going to apply those styles at the end, and the style uh, will be the same. All right. <clears throat> So we're gonna look at some text fun because um, one of my favorite things to do with CSS animations and just in general is find fun things to do with text. So let me find my thing. All right, so um, with absolute positioning and uh, before and after is what we're gonna be talking about. So has anybody used before and after selectors? Okay, great. Um, so before, if you haven't used it, before and after basically are um, their display. Um, they only like they don't they don't show, they show up in the DOM, but they're not going to be like your actual content. You're not going to write words with them. Uh, you can, but you are going to use those for decorations, not things that um, that are going to be like interacted with much by the user. So um, let me find. This. All right. So the other thing is if you've ever worked with before and after, there's a content. Um, you always have to have content, whether it's going to be blank, it could be an empty string, or it can be, which I did not know this until recently because I always use it as an empty string, but you can also have different, if you have a data attribute tag, you can add that content in. So my data attribute for this uh, this element is actually the mm pizza as well. All right, so let's see what happens here. All right, so, oh, I kind of went too fast, but 
Um, so with our animation of before, what it's doing is it's taking our data text attribute, which is also mm pizza, and it is animating behind it the letters so that it makes it a really cool text effect. Effect. So looking at the animation itself, um, I have my variables that I use in SAS, and I've in, they're all here for my colors. So I've chosen some of those colors, and I have... Uh, Sorry guys, the zoom is like all in my screen. And so it's hard for me to keep track of where I am. <laughs> so um, so with all of those colors, I have listed those here. And one cool thing about SAS is it allows you to do these functions that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do with regular CSS. So with this, what I did is I imported my colors here and I made them into a variable. And then I um, created this mix-in that will take a random color and within my keyframes, it will randomize these colors right here. The other cool thing that you can do with text and CSS is, and this is not like um, necessarily um, usable on every browser, but we can do what's called a text stroke. So you have an outline on your text, which gives it a cooler animation. So we can do like that. And like it outlines your text for you, just to kind of give it a little extra emphasis. All right, and then I have one more. Um, I can find my thing. Sorry, guys. Uh, where am I going? I'm at before and after. And I put that one. No. Nope. nope, that's not it either. Before and after. Okay. Oh, here we go. All right, so here's my second example of something that you can do with text. All right. So with this, we're gonna be playing with a little bit with background. So we've got a background. And we are going to take the background and we're gonna actually animate it. So in order to do this, we need to increase the background size so that the animation will work correctly. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to do what's called clip. We're going to clip our text to the background. So what's going to happen when we do this WebKit background clip? We're going to background clip text. Is this going to do, it's going to, it's behind the, the letters right now. Okay. Now we'll do a stroke, a WebKit text stroke of 6% transparent or 6px transparent. So now we have the background with the text and now the background is outlined around the test. All right, and then the last piece is to animate. So, let's see if this works correctly. So again, because our before um, is positioned absolutely, um, it's right behind it. Let's see, did I get to do this work correctly? There we go. All right, and so now we have a moving background. I know it's kind of hard to see on this text, but there's a moving background. Um, behind our text, okay? Um, and really that's it. I had one more slide, but this was really for me, um, playing with CSS. Um, and I don't have any, um, all of my comments. But basically with all of these things you can do um, with animations, transitions, you can do all sorts of things um, and, and things that like a lot of times people will go to CS or JavaScript for to animate, but you don't have to necessarily do that. You can do a lot of the things um, uh, like of animations uh, in SAS and a lot of randomization. Uh, SAS allows you to write functions and things like that within the CSS itself. So you don't have to always rely on JavaScript. All right. Um, and with that, I'll just go ahead and I will show. So we've got all these animations. The other thing about animations is you can delay them. So I have the last, the last, uh, number in your animation is a delay. Um, so it, you can make it wait a few seconds. All right. So then. Last thing. And the other thing about SAS is it allows you to write dry CSS, which honestly, this is not because I did not have time. <laughs> All right. 
All right. <laughs> it's not going to work. It's, it knows you. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, there it is. Well, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. All right, I'm not going to try any more longer, any longer, but I'll read her with it one more time, but I don't think it's going to work. But anyways, <laughs> I, knew, I knew I was going to go before Sashi. Sashi, you're lucky. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for letting me talk, and I hope that you'll uh, you learn something about animation that'll make you have fun with it. Oh, are you ready? We are introducing our next speaker, who again it's his first talk ever. So, big round of applause! Bring it over, Ryan. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Ryan. Share, your Share my screen. That's a good idea. Share my screen with Zoom. Oh, the screen. Here we go. All right. All right. So, uh, yeah, this is a talk about CSS. I'm not a UI designer, so this looks awful. I'm able to follow mockups really well. My mockup guy was busy with work, so. Uh, I'm doing a talk about pseudo elements. Uh, don't know if we know what those are, but let's start with what they aren't. They are not created with a pseudo keyword in Unix command lines, and they are not related to pseudofed. This is not breaking bad. You are not Walter White. All right, so what are they? They are special selectors that allow you to select parts of elements. So for example, the backdrop of a modal or the marker of an unordered list. So here's a list of pseudo elements. Uh, we've got after, backdrop, before, queue, queue region. Queue and queue region relate to uh, like the subtitles of a video. Uh, and I'm gonna just show you what some of those are like in, a, in an actual demo. So here we go. We're going to full screen this real quick and full screen this guy. Right next to each other and pull up the web page. All right. And let us make this bigger. It's a little too big. All right. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. It is my first time. All right. So here we just have two divs with uh, before and after selectors in them. Uh, the before selector uh, is appended before all of the uh, children of an element uh, as a child of the element after is uh, similar, it is appended after. What, is the, what do the styles look like here? The styles are literally just a red square. Uh, very simple. All right, and then um, another, another thing I've got here. This is actually how I found out about pseudo elements. I was building a location nav bar for work. I had no idea how I was gonna go about this. Um, I thought some fancy border stuff was gonna work and my team lead stumbled upon pseudo selectors. Sorry, pseudo elements. And I think it might be the next comment down. Yeah, it's these, this uh, hierarchy section right here. So let me go ahead and show that. And if I, I shouldn't zoom in because the, the spacing will be off because I just did this really quick, but this vertical line right here uh, is a before element, uh, maybe after, I don't recall. Let's take a look. Right here, I believe, no, we've got the height, height zero. So this is the before. Uh, on all of these elements. So I'm sorry, let me scroll down. Again, I'm really nervous. Sorry, everybody. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so the border radius, because we're getting a pill shape here and a width of eight pixels. So that width of eight pixels is this element right here. And then the height of 98 pixels, very good. That's another before element right here. So I was building this hierarchy for uh, location nav bar, stumbled across pseudo elements. And the reason I wanted to give this talk 
was because I thought that if you were seven years into your career as a software engineer or self-teaching, you should understand what a pseudo element was. All right, so my next little demo piece down here, uh, it looks like it's gonna be with a dialogue. So if I open the dialogue, uh, it has a background, uh, a backdrop, which has a really weird color. Uh, we can see that right here. I just set a background property. Right. And then moving on. We have uh, the ability to mess with the first line or in the first letter of the paragraph or just any text in an element. So I'll go ahead. I can uncomment the uh, first line example. You can see I've got a really weird uh, background on the first line of text. And here I've messed with the first character as well. Um, this can be useful. You usually aren't going to use it for background colors on text. You're probably going to bold it or something to that effect. But again, I don't know how to make things look good without somebody else telling me how to make it look. All right. So the next selector that I wanted to show y'all was the file selector button right here. So the file selector button specifies the file button. This is a specific type of element that I didn't know about until I was putting this presentation together. So it is an input type of uh, file, sorry, a file, not file upload, a file. So you can see that I was able to change the color of that button and it didn't change the color of this actual button that is an input of type button. All right, and then we have an unordered list unordered lists uh, are not my favorite thing to work with. I, I assure you. Uh, so here we're able to change the marker. I saw this actually. I was really surprised. You can't do the same thing here that you can with before and after. You cannot adjust the marker to look like a pill. Uh, you can't put borders on it. You can't put a background color on it. Uh, so in this instance, we're using content. Uh, to give it a specific look, and then you're adjusting the way that content looks. Uh, what you will find as you are using the, uh, sorry, wrong key. What you will find as you're using pseudo elements is that not all CSS properties apply to all of them. Um, so going on to the next one, and uh, right here we have uh, an input element, and we are going to be styling the placeholder text. So the placeholder text uh, uses the placeholder uh, pseudo element, and we can just adjust the way that placeholder text looks, uh, as you might expect. And for our last little guy right here, we have just an example of some text. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with lorem ipsum, but we're able to adjust the way the selection works. This is with this uh, pseudo element on and this is with it off uh yeah you're just able to change the way you select text you could probably do some really cool stuff where you change the font family this could be fun courier i don't think that worked hmm. all right well that was a little bit of a fail right there uh does anybody have any questions before i step down i know i was a lot faster uh than other people but if uh, nobody's, what's up? So for the pseudo elements, yes. Yes, yes, I'm sorry, I should have explained that. Yeah, if uh, we look back over here at the, uh, the presentation, the slideshow I put together, uh, yeah, it is these colon, colon, and then a keyword, similar to how you would use a pseudo class, uh, you're able to select a portion of an element with the colon colon special keyword. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, that's all I've got. Thank you, everybody.
All right. Our next speaker, amazing, very handsome. Uh, I'm going to hide this and hide these meeting controls. And can you hear me? Uh, okay. So everything good? All right. So I saw something interesting in tonight. And so I, I was actually making a talk on something completely different. And I decided that number one, I don't think the talk does justice to what I was planning to do within the time frame. but I had an interesting question come up on Twitter. And if you know me at all, you know, I tend to run my mouth a little bit extra on Twitter. And when I was on Twitter, someone had kind of brought up the subject of how people make animations or make um, certain things do, you know, CSS stuff outside of the norm. And I was like, well, there's tons of use cases for things like that where it's custom animation buttons or it's custom designs and things like that. And it got me thinking, I know a lot of people are maybe somewhat familiar with this property, but I don't think they know it to the extent of what it could possibly be utilized. So today's talk is actually gonna be, I should probably in increase the sizes. I tend to do small, there we go. Today's talk is gonna be revolving around the subject of transform, all right? What is transform really used for? What is the use cases? Um, trying to get you way more comfortable with the idea of what transform really is. But I think one of the bigger ideas is to get you utilizing it in more flows instead of trying to use janky things or a, even if you're reading some other code, you can kind of follow along. Like in Sarah's great presentation, there was great use cases of TranslateX that I saw. And same thing with uh, Ryan's presentation, I saw use cases of Translate or transform with using translate X and translate Y, but it goes a little bit further. So I thought I'd kind of explain this, a, a few of the properties, showcase some examples, and then I can showcase something that I've made in the past as well um, to give you an idea of what that use case could possibly and potentially look like. I know you're really excited. I heard some emotion back there. I got it, I got it, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let me get this going. All right, so, the idea of the premise here is the first examples that we're going to be going over is three boxes. Essentially, the idea is I'm going to be transforming the center box. That's why it says watch me work. But we're going to be going over a couple of properties. So to give you an idea, in the HTML, we just have a class of boxes with three boxes inside of it. Nothing major there. And I'll kind of walk you through my CSS code just to give you an idea. So the box is uh, for the main class of boxes, we're basically using something that is very distinct and important. We're using Flexbox and cross salty because one thing that I want to demonstrate is even with the elements that we're touching, even though it's inside of a Flexbox, altering it, moving it, adjusting it does not destroy or diminish its position within that Flexbox property. So we can totally alter this in any way we want while still maintaining the order and the classes of what that flex box may be. So here, just to give you an idea, box one and box two are exactly the same. And so uh, it's just, you know, just basic white colored boxes, uh, slightly off white. And the main idea here now is with, in regards to box number two. So showing you this image again, we have two white boxes and we have our main center box in the middle. Now to help with illustrative purposes, I've added some opacity to that so we can kind of see what's happening as it goes over other items. But to give you an idea here, we are using our uh, flex box for the content inside of it just so that way we can center that text imaging and we have our background colors and all that good stuff there. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm translating Y. And so let me go this, uncomment and save. Translating Y means I'm moving this box on its Y axis. There's an X axis, there's a Y axis. So Y axis is obviously we're moving left to right. So as I go back here, oh, uh, Y axis up to down, sorry, reverse that. So we're moving this down, right? So by translating that, you see it hasn't diminished or destroyed the way we have Flexbox situated by moving that box out of the way. It hasn't collapsed the other two boxes and replaced those properties. It's kept it exactly the same. So now if I were to go back and recomment this again, Whoops, that doesn't even matter anymore anyway, so don't worry there. That, that was all part of it, y'all. Actually, I don't know why I'm, I'm so used to holding mics that, there we go, there we go. Now I got two hands, all right. So now this time if I'm going translation of X instead, we obviously see that not only has it moved to the side, it's gone over the existing properties. This is really important. And the reason why I'm highlighting this specifically, because if you make certain designs, let's say like you make lines cross each other, 
normal properties without that would probably clash, push, there'd be margins added to it or things like that. This allows you to overlap properties. So you can make very nice transitions and animations utilizing this, but it still holds the property within that flex box, meaning just because we've overlapped it on top of another box, it hasn't pushed box three into boxes two position. So really, really important. I'm explaining this now because it's gonna come into use later when we show the animation that we're gonna be working on together. Uh, so going back to this, if I re-comment that and I come back here, there's also the use case here. And this is a, a pretty useful use case in a lot of scenarios. Uh, you can not only translate it, we can rotate said box. So by rotation of it, we're moving that box over through the translation to X, but also through the rotation, we've been able to turn it 135 degrees. So now if there were several use cases, for example, if we wanted an animation that say, enter your password and password is entered and now moves the loading screen to the side, that could be a really cool animation to get into a web page, things like that. There's so many use cases for something like that. Now, here's the thing that I love the most about transform, scaling. Does anybody know what scaling is? Nobody? Okay, not everybody raise their hand. The really cool thing with scaling in particular when it comes to transform is all the items within the box scale with that box as well. So it's all the elements within it. So one of the really cool things here is as we see the box has gotten larger, but so has the text without being distorted, without being broken, it adjusts accordingly. This is one thing that even though it seems very simplistic, I see mistakes coming up with, especially with early devs, because they're not realizing that every element inside of it is gonna scale accordingly. So keep that in mind when you're, if you're using this property, that anything within it will scale at the same rate. And the last one that we'll go over here is gonna be skewing. So skewing is you turn it sideways, you can skew it a little bit, depending on the degree that you wanna use. Could be tons of use cases for this. Um, but those are like the main properties that you do utilize with transform. Now I'm gonna kind of comment all of this out here, saving that and commenting these boxes out. And the use case that I wanna go over with you, and this is something that you see pretty often and some people just don't realize that, oops, da, 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 da. what happened? So we'll save that. We're, we're doing a drop down menu basically. And so from here, whoops. R. And so from here, we have a drop down menu, okay? And this drop down menu, if you see, let me try and make this a little bit larger. So we see here we have a drop down menu. If we had items in that menu or things like that, I didn't add any items because I don't think that serves the point to what we're doing at this moment. But if you had items in it, when you clicked on it, the menu would drop down all those cells, right? Instead, and so we have this arrow here saying, go down. But when it's clicked, we now transform everything and the arrow is not face it up. It's two lines that are co coinciding together through the transform property. And so that little bit of user experience lets the user know like, hey, click it to go back up, click it to go down. Very simple, but very extremely realistic use case of how you'd utilize this in a production environment, utilizing at a company, whatever it may be. But it adds to the experience. It's a little thing, but that's one thing that I've often said about websites often the little touches add to the whole experience. So little suggestive things like this add to the user experience, unless the user knows happening. And those cues can kind of be a lead and a guide to next steps forward, because we want to guide our users to what it is. My job, my specialty at work is sales funnels. So I'm constantly thinking like, how can I guide customers to the best way possible? So I'm always thinking of like little touches where we can add to that experience. And this is just one way to do that. So if we had, let's say for example, a drop down where we were entering credit card information, for example. This could be a great way to go from a collapse state to a state with fields, letting them know what needs to be entered next. Um, that is my talk. I know I blew your minds, but really, really happy to be a part of this and happy to give this talk. And after this, we'll be going on to one more talk. Uh, we saved the best for last. Mr. Shashi Lo, please, the floor is yours. Yeah.
Muted. Screen. Reading controls. All right, I am nervous as well. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I'm serious. But they did save the best for last, right? Yeah, well, you know, hello everybody. Uh, today I'm here to speak about pixel perfect implementation. So uh, if you don't know me, my name is Shashi Lo. Um, I'm a senior software engineer at Microsoft. Uh, I work on the Microsoft Pricing Experience team. It's an umbrella under Azure, um, and I am from Austin, Texas. Um, I drove up this afternoon just for this. <laughs> All right, so who here has worked with UX designers? Raise your hand, and for you online, give me a thumbs up, okay? like pretty much half the room, all right? Next question is, who here is a UX designer? We got one, maybe two, three. They don't wanna raise their hands because they don't wanna you know, say that they are. Okay, cool. Um, but we know that designers, they are very particular, right? They are very particular. They want things, what? Pixel perfect, great. Uh, and there's a saying that goes, you haven't worked with a designer until you've worked with a designer. Okay, uh-huh. That's kind of confusing, right? Yep. But have you ever been yelled at for a mixing, uh, missing one pixel? Yes. If you have, then you've worked with a designer. That's what I'm talking about. All right, so what does pixel perfect mean? Right. It means that we should accurately bring a designer's work to life. All the research and iterations that they've gone through, no one will see it living or breathing until we implement it into code. That means that we need to be meticulous and become detail oriented. Um, seeing and understanding the design, kind of seeing all the, the, the typography, um, seeing every space, seeing every pixel. Um, but now let's jump into an example. So this design is from a front end mentor. Um, it's a pretty simple component, um, a pretty simple design, but <clears throat> let's look at how I was able to implement this poorly. Boom. Can you spot the differences? Kind of, probably not. Well, let me put it together so that you could do that. All right, so on the left side is the design and on the right side is my implementation. Now, can you spot some differences? No, because design developers, we do everything perfectly, right? We do everything so great that designers won't even see it. I'm just kidding. There are differences and let's look at those. All right, so as you can see, I'm gonna go into the code a little bit, but the border radius is a little bit off. <clears throat> I've implemented it at 15 border pixels. The padding was at 14 on the top and left and right, opposed to 16. And then the font size is a tad off as well. And there is right now no box shatter. So how do I know this? Uh, well, before we do that, let's jump into, um, an example of why we're not good at identifying design. Oh, how is this gonna work? There we go. Oopsies. All right. So you see this box. Raise your hand if you think that the box is white and the background over here is light gray. Raise your hand. Okay, just a few. Okay, let's reverse that. Who thinks that the box in the center is light gray, but the background is white? Okay, just a few. Well, I just wanna let you guys know that you guys are all wrong. 
<laughs> All right, let me show you guys. All right, there's a tool called Color Slurp that can color pick the colors on the screen. All right, so let's go to the box first. What is it gonna be? It is white, okay? So now let's go check out the background. Well, before we do that, I'm gonna give you a chance to redeem yourself. Do you think that the background is white? Raise your hand, okay? And who, do, who thinks it's light gray? Raise your hand or put your thumbs up, okay? Here we go, moment of truth. It's white, okay? Did the host not advertise that there was going to be a magician on stage? Ta-da! <laughs> All right, so let me show you. The box has this box shadow. And so once I remove that, keep a close eye on it. It's just white. Okay, so let me add it back. Boom, right? And then if, if I show you the rest of the CSS, which there's a lot of CSS here, the background is just white, right? That's it. There's no other colors. Everything else is transparent. So before we figure out like why our brains do this, let me go back and show you an example, another example. We all know this dress, right? It is the dress of all dresses. It is a black and blue dress. No controversies here. It's a black and blue dress, okay? So why do our brains work this way? Our brains translate ambient lights and shadows into what we think is coming up next or into what it thinks is coming up next, not us. Um, it auto completes solution for us as it sees fit. Same with the shadow, right? The shadow, is, it was blending to a gray and all of a sudden your eyes thought that it was gray. So that is why it is so difficult as developers to take designs and make them so perfect. All right, let's jump into the implementation and look at the Figma design to, to get the, uh, the details that we need. Okay, so this is my implementation. Um, I better check this. It looks correct. Okay, it's wrong. Okay. Um, and there's this tool called Perfect Pixel. Um, there's a lot of plugins out there that allow you to do this, but this tool is called Perfect Pixel. It allows us to put a flattened image on top of your implementation so that you can see how well or how poorly you have implemented a design into code. Okay. So let's check this out. So I've had to set up so that the design, uh-oh. All right, give me. Give me a few seconds here as we move this. It's all set up until now. I think Sarah did something to this computer. Okay, so as you can see, the left side is my implementation and the right side is the design. And if I look, change the opacity, you can see how off I am, right? Um, but if I turn on the contrast here, it'll be, able, it'll be easier to see. My implementation image will be blue and the font will be black. The correct one will be yellow and the text will be white. So as you see here, if I overlay it properly, you can see that I am pretty off, right? But if I didn't have this tool, I would think that it was pretty close, correct? Okay, so now let's dig into the, the Figma design real quick. All right, so this is the Figma design and you everything you need is in this design, all the details and everything, right? So if I double click on this <coughs> card on the outside, and go to inspect this tab up here, you can see that the border radius is 20. Um, my, my border radius is what's, what's 15. 
And then as well as if you hover over elements, you can see the spacing between them. The panning I have is 14 pixels, but it's actually 16 on top and left and right. Same thing if I clicked on this and hovered over the, uh, this text element, the margin between it is 24. But if I click into the font itself, you can see there's a lot of properties here. The font size is 22, line height is 28. That's kind of all I need. And the color here was a little bit off too, but we can go back here. So I've saved some time and I've already adjusted this with the correct CSS. Okay. This is probably not going to work the way I wanted to earlier, but how many of you think that I was able to implement this pixel perfect? Raise your hands. If you think that I did, nobody. Oh man, so sad. Whew. All right, let's take, let's take a look at this. All right, hold on. Let me move this. Okay, let me adjust this. Okay, this is the same exact image, okay? Just different CSS. All right, watch this. Did you see anything different? A, a, a tad, okay, a tad. Okay, all right, but let's turn the contrast on. And as you can see here, if I, it's a little bit off, right? But it's pretty much pixel perfect. All right, so. In closing, it is our job to accurately bring design to life, okay? Let me rephrase that. It is our job as developers to be pixel perfect. And I wanna leave you with one last thing. Now that you can use, uh, I wanna leave you with one last thing. You can now use this brand new title on your resume and LinkedIn profile. And that is that you are a CSS magician. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So uh, give anybody the permission to uh, turn their camera on. Yeah. So we are at the end of the meetup. One thing that we do at the end of every single meetup that we do is we have everybody just kind of gather around together for one like group photo. If you feel comfortable doing that, please do so. Virtually, if you want to turn your cameras on, we'll allow you to be part of the photo as well. So I'm going to turn all the cameras on here, hide that there. Oh, whoops, how do I hide these? Full screen this. Cool. Yeah, so if you feel comfortable turning the camera on, I see people already popping up. And everybody, please come in the front. We'll take a couple photos real fast, and then we'll get on to the next part of this. Turn this on. I'll tell y'all when we're done taking the photo. I'll tell y'all, okay? So just got to bear with us for a couple seconds while we get everybody kind of lined up. And there we go. Some, yeah, some can stand up here. Some can be on the bottom. That way you can see everybody. Yeah. Yeah. How many people in the back? Oh, it's great. I feel like I should be in the front. Back. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 Are you coming up? I can't see. I'm sure you do not this one at all. Yeah. 
So try. Did it go? <laughs> Why do I need a flash? <laughs> Thank you all so much for being a part of this. Hopefully, you can, yeah, you can hear me. Thank you so much for being a part of this. We're going to be closing this down now. There's going to be some like in-person networking and all that. I hope you all connected, made some new friends and all that good stuff. Again, thank you for being a part of the event. And I'll see you at the next one. Bye, everybody. Yeah, shut it down. <laughs> <laughs>